and welcome back to the Healthcare Executive Insights Podcast. My name is Elliot Sloan with the McCallum Group, and today we are very excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Stephanie Higashi, who is the CEO at Health at Last. Dr. Higashi, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Of course. Thanks for having us. So can you start with telling me a little bit about your professional background and then share with us uh, more details about Health at Last? Sure. So my background is I have an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, then went to the Los Angeles College of Chiropractic that's now known as Southern California University of Health Science and became a doctor of chiropractic. And my husband and I, uh, Dr. Wayne Higashi, took over a pre-existing practice and we grew it from about 35 patients a week to about 365 patients a week. Outgrew our space and, you know, also started seeing in the space of healthcare, there was a necessity to start integrating and providing more services in one location for a patient. So we then uh, began to create an integrated model where we started offering medical, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, and physical therapy with really great results with patients lowering and eliminating unnecessary drugs and surgery, getting greater function, better compliance, better integration, and and just a, a better practice model for providers because you can ask each other what's going on and get better results with patients. And so then in 2012, we created Health at Last, which is a multi-specialty healthcare franchise. And we did it because although our corporate headquarters in West Los Angeles and we're getting awesome results of helping the people in that community, we realized that people of Earth also needed the same type of thing. So we've spread across the country. We have clinics, you know, anywhere from Idaho, Arizona, Colorado, Texas, getting ready to open up some in uh New York and New Jersey and Florida. And, you know, our goal is we want to really make it so that we can provide excellent care, have doctors want to be doctors again and enjoy and have the joy and passion of healing and helping people. And then once we spread across the U.S. to about 50 locations, we'll start going to first world country, English speaking countries. Then we'll go to foreign language, first world speaking countries, and then ultimately to third world countries and help as many ways as we possibly can. Wow, that's amazing. And thank you for sharing uh, that backdrop. Um, it's very exciting to learn more about Health at Last. It seems like you really have um, big ambitions to grow. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit more about um, who is a good fit for Health at Last? Like what type of providers are you looking to partner with? Yeah, and so we look for people that have the same purpose you know, that are driven with the same purpose to lower and eliminate unnecessary drugs and surgery, to really handle the situations that we see in the current marketplace. You know, what we've seen, I've been in practice for 23 years, and when I take an interview with a patient, in the past, it would be like very few patients would be on medications, maybe one or two. Now there's people that are on seven, eight, ten different medications, sometimes even more, you know, and then there's also a problem of access to care where people are like not able to get the care that they need and want, or it's like they're being referred to a specialist that can see them in a month and a half to three months, which is like, okay, they're either dead or better. Either way, by then they don't need this person. And so the people we're looking for are people that are super passionate about helping and changing the current marketplace so that we have better outcomes, uh, better access to care, and have the goals and purposes to lower and eliminate unnecessary drugs and surgery and want to change what's happening and make you know, people have health because when you have health, you can function, you can have a job, you can work, you can enjoy your family, you can produce, you know, you don't go to uh, drugs or depression or crime because if you can work, you don't need to steal. You have your own job, you have your own money, right? But when people have pain and they can't work and they get depressed and then they take drugs and then they can't afford their drugs, they go to that way. So we're looking for people that have this exact same total passion and purpose. And so we have many, many healthcare providers MDs, doctors of osteopathy, chiropractors, uh, pharmacists that are part of our franchise and as franchise owners. But we also have people that are non-licensed individuals. And these non-licensed individuals have been in private sector, whether it be working at big companies like Amazon or executives with uh, banking, you know, and have done these different things. And they're like, okay, been there, done that in the big corporate America. But we see that health is not being handled in a really optimal way. And they're joining and being on board with us with this purpose to further what we want to get accomplished. So those are the types of people that we attract and the people that are ideal for us are people that have the same like passion, drive, and want to make this happen and making it a better place. Yeah, and I love that. And I think that the I think everyone can agree that the healthcare uh, market is really broken and fractured. Um, 
you know, in our country and many other countries around the world. And um, it seems like the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies have too much leverage of and control over the proper course of care for patients. You're completely right, Elliot. And the other part that I look at is like, it's not going to come from a big government to fix this problem. It's going to come from people caring and forming these groups to change it. And it's going to come from providers who are educated and see how they can best treat patients. And that's what really we need to do is we need to turn healthcare back over to providers, the ones that have been trained on how to treat patients. And we need to also make sure that the education that people get in the universities to become medical doctors or chiropractors, et cetera, are also not funded and influenced by pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, we wanna make sure that providers know that there are solutions to helping a patient you know, if someone's obese, okay, let's find out why. Is it because they hurt their knee and we got to fix their knee so they can then exercise, so they can then lose weight and they can eat properly and have a good diet versus if traditionally it's like, okay, you're overweight, do you have diabetes? Let's put you on a medication. Okay, now you have this other issue. Let's put you on another medication. Like this isn't working anymore. We need to go back to the basics of like what is health, what is long-term sustaining lifestyle choices that create a day-to-day -day choice that creates health that's sustainable you know these quick fixes are you know not ideal you know or and even people that are like oh have you heard of this new drug where you can lose weight it's like yeah oh there's the ozempic right it's like there's also called get out of pain get active exercise and <laughs> eat a healthy diet you know and obviously, if you have an underlying condition, and there are a lot that can cause weight gain, and there's medications that can cause weight gain. Many psychiatric drugs cause weight gain. Many, uh, you know, steroids cause weight gain. There's reasons, you know, and some people have depression, which can cause weight gain, right? And so if we can get to the root cause, fix the cause, then we have a long-term sustainable solution. And that's what we really want to go back to for healthcare. And you're right. It can't be dictated and directed by either a special interest group of pharmaceuticals that have an interest of making money off people taking medications. Mm -hmm. And it can't also be directed by an insurance company who has an interest to collect premiums but not pay for care, yep. right? Those, those special interests don't work. Like we need to have doctors who their interest is, I wanna make people better. Yeah. <laughs> like I want people to live and have long-term health and longevity and be healthy and happy and joyful and have not just them healthy, but their children and their children's children healthy. And that's what we're really looking to do with Health Alive. That's such a powerful mission, and I can support it a thousand percent. I believe that we are going about healthcare incorrectly. We're not preventative, we're reactive, and we're just shoving medications down people's throats that we might not even weigh in the side effects and the negative impacts that all these medications could have if we're focus so much on putting a Band-Aid on an issue. Um, I actually saw a video. I don't know how credible it is, but I'm going to bring it up because I keep thinking about it. But I, I saw a video that claims way back uh, when the Rockefellers were really building their empire, they created the pharma pharmaceutical industry and they stripped a lot of the knowledge around holistic, natural, homeopathic medicine out of all the textbooks of all the medical schools and universities and really created um, an environment where you were shunned if you tried to uh, practice the, you know, using natural remedies to heal patients that have been around for thousands of years and forced these young doctors and students to learn how to prescribe drugs as they were building this massive uh, pharmaceutical um, industry in America. Have you heard anything along those lines? I've definitely seen and heard different things that have been out there. I haven't tested the validity of the video or what the history of it is, but the fact is in present time, you know, we've sent tons of ads on TV in America of like, are you depressed? Do you need this medication? Ask your doctor. Like any person watching it would be like, there's a pretty puppy and a girl. And you're like, maybe I need that drug. And you're like, wait a minute, you know? And so, you know, we're concerned about what we see. And we are concerned about these natural technologies that have existed through time of 
certain herbs or supplements or, you know, foods that can and do help handle the body, you know? And so it's like, we need to go back to those basics versus just everything synthetic and everything drugs and drug for drugs or drug. I mean, God knows we do need pharmaceuticals in certain cases, you know, yeah. like if you have a disease, it may be your only choice, but what I'm looking to do is get rid of the unnecessary what's the unnecessary overprescribed, wrongly prescribed medications. And that's what we're working towards doing and bringing back some of that older technology that has existed in our history of mankind of like, you know, what's really funny is in India, they've been using turmeric as an anti-inflammatory. They eat it in their food like almost every day, right? Then all of a sudden the United States is like, oh, there's these turmeric supplements and the Indians are like, ha, ha, ha. We've been doing this for decades, years, and millenniums, you know? But it's like the, there is wisdom that does exist in nature. And I think if we utilize it and we just go back to balance and health and, you know, we can't always be in front of a screen. We can't always just be drinking coffee and energy drinks and not eating food and not interacting with humans. That's what's causing some of this, you know, dysregulation and unhealthiness. But if we pull back and be like, hey, we're going to create groups, we're going to get together, we're going to sit down in the park and, you know, chat about the day and unwind and all of these healthy habits that may seem, you know, not necessarily medically prescribed, but are important for us as humans to connect and form groups and create happiness and health. It really does help. So those are the things we're doing in our communities with Health at Last. I love it. And I often think about why doesn't this start? Why doesn't uh, holistic medicine and um, health in general start from an early age in our schools, right? Like, why don't they really drill down on the importance of exercise and eating healthy and mindful meditation and, you know, not only physical health, but mental health as well? Um, it seems like uh, now that I'm, you know, in my mid thirties, I'm learning all these things on how to optimize my body and my mind. And I'm like, where was this when I was a teenager? Like, why couldn't someone share this, this beautiful path to a happy life with me from an earlier age? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, again, it's going to take all of us as a group contributing and individuals contributing. So like a perfect example, like if you're part of Health at Last, I would say, I want you to go to your local schools and I want you to talk to them about a balanced diet, nutrition and exercise they could do that could help them unwind and how to deal with stress and how, how much water they need to drink a day, you know, these types of things. Because if we depend on the government to then tell the teachers to then implement it into a curriculum and this, that, and the other, it may not actually happen. But if we go back to just educating on a grassroots level and educating on people what is needed and what's not needed and what are good choices and why we think those are good choices. Right now across America, there's been a big push of doing marijuana as either recreation or to relax or I don't know what. But the problem is, is the facts of it, of like, here's, you know, it slows down your brain function. It can cause you to eat more and you could gain weight from it. It can cause you to doze off and not be, you know, totally there and present and as nap and pop as you would be mentally otherwise. And it's like, if we don't educate our youth about that, but they see all these ads and these pretty buildings and their friends doing it, they're going to go towards that. So sure. what I'm wanting to do with this movement and campaign is that we push together you know, as individuals to help our group and help our community, which will then spread globally and make that difference. Yeah, I think you're right. It really can't be from the top down. It's got to be from the bottom up for this to really make big change. And another thing I often think about is you would think the insurance companies more than anyone want everyone to be healthier, right? They pay the bill when someone's in the emergency room or in the hospital for a week or dealing with diabetes and diseases that get worse and worse and spiral into very expensive procedures and medications where if people were more focused on their health, that a lot of this can be prevented. And you would think they would want to lead the charge on getting America as healthy as possible because they are technically the ones who have to foot the bill on the unhealthy population. You're right, Elliot. And so here's what happens is they do a short-term solution that cause a long-term disaster. And what we need to do is have a long-term solution that's long-term, right? So example of this, if the insurance companies, they have to pay every single time a patient gets seen. So if they want to limit the patient's visit to, you know, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, they want to make it short, quick, in and out. They don't want to authorize a lot of things, you know, so the, and they don't pay well, so then the insurance and the doctor, the doctor's like, oh, I have to see for an hour. 
it's not enough time to educate somebody or give people a full evaluation. So by shortcutting it at the beginning, you have this disaster at the end. But if we could back it up and say, all right, from now on, insurance companies are going to pay, you know, an hour of wellness class, an hour of consultation on diet and nutrition, an hour on how to properly lift and sit at your computer and ergonomics. And if they provided that every year for every single patient, not everyone's going to participate or actually go and do it. But if it was available and doctors were reimbursed highly to perform that, what would happen is you would have less back problems. People aren't lifting wrong. You'd have less issues of people eating incorrectly. And you'd have less issues where people don't know what to do or having stress. So if we spent the money on that part, mm -hmm. you'd have less crisis care on the end part. But that's the reason. You're right, Elliot. That so it would make sense. It would be logical that they <laughs> would. But that's the reason why they're not. Is they're just like, okay, let's just see them, get them in and out, have you know, just do this crisis care, hoping we don't get to a crisis. But we need to back it up and go. How do we create prevention? And all of the wisest people, you know, they've said, you know. Uh, what is it? Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? And it's like people have known this, you know, Benjamin Franklin and Edison, all these people have always said, we need to do prevention, prevention, prevention. Like we know that that is the ultimate solution. It's easier to prevent something than once you get it, having to treat it and maybe trying to reverse irreversible damage. It's hard, much easier to prevent diabetes than to treat diabetes and the sequela of diabetes as an example. Oh, so yeah. I think we have to work together and educate ourselves and others into these better lifestyle choices. And then we have to peer pressure each other too. When it's like, are you sure you want to supersize that Big Mac and get a cafe that's like this big with this much, you know, sugar and fat and things like we have to kind of peer pressure ourselves too, to keep our ethics in on what are good choices. Yeah. And it seems like there's just so much lobbying power between what they put in our foods the concentrates, the fake sugars, um, that, you know, we are, we don't even know what we're putting in our bodies. Like in Europe, they put big labels like this will kill you. This has got pesticides. Like we don't do that here. And it's such a shame because I believe that a lot of our cancers and diseases are self-inflicted and big corporations know they're doing a ton of damage, but they're ultimately trying to squeeze out as much profits and mass produce as quickly and cheaply as possible. But the average consumer does not know any better. They just think if it's at the supermarket and it's on the shelf, it can't hurt me. Correct. Yeah. So we got to get the education out there and we have to, you know, make it so that the consumer knows because the consumer can drive change, right? If people are interested in the money at the end of the day for business, which of course businesses have to have money to exist. But if like the consumers start demanding, hey, I don't want this white bread. I want whole bread, you know, like whole wheat, whole, you know, nutrients. And so then they're like, oh, well, our customers won't eat the white bread. They'll stop making white bread, you know? Sure. And so it's more of like, as we continue to educate the consumer and on this grassroots level, that's what will create the demand, you know? And if people like, for example, stop wanting marijuana because they got educated about it, there's no demand. These shops will shut down. You know, they're like, we're not making money on that. We're making money instead on a mindful exercise class and a diet nutrition of like, how do you eat healthy to feel good? You know, then we can create that change even by creating the demand for it. Sure. I've got a question. It's a kind of a sensitive topic, but I'm sure you've heard it. Um, I don't know the truth behind it, but you, you've probably heard people talk about that cancers, they should be curable by now, but there's too much money to be made by treating it versus curing it. What are your thoughts? No, it's really hard. I can tell you when, when I did my undergraduate in biochemistry, we started a lot of molecular cellular developmental biology and studied a lot about cancers. I've had family members and patients die of cancer. So it's, you know, very dear to my heart. And I think that there, there genuinely are a lot of people actively doing cancer research and really actually trying to eradicate it. I know that that is a truth. And I know the doctors that are treating and looking into the eyes of patients that are dying, they really want people to not die. That is the truth. Of course. But, you know, the real issue is why are we getting cancers? You know, why is the body having these cancers and why in other species we don't see it? You know, what's going on? So I think at that moment we have to go, you know, what are we consuming, whether it be you know, chemically put into our body, environmentally, 
food, diet, nutrition, genetic changes, things we're exposed to. You know, the problem that I've had with some of our friends that actually work in cancer research, what they've said is like, it's hard to ever have a cure. And the reason is, is there's one, there's so many different types of cancer. And then the cancer morphs so often that you're chasing it constantly. But the people that I have talked to that have said that they have been able to cure cancer and get rid of cancer, it usually comes down to what they had found as the root cause of it, which is some sort of disorder with the body or some sort of like thing that's been going wrong and they're able to fix that and then that handles the issue. Sure. So, you know, I think it's a hard topic because there is so many types of abnormal cells and yeah. why are these cells becoming abnormal and how come the body's not able to correct the abnormal cells because cells turn over every day and usually they they turn over and a new one forms and it's perfect but then why is it all of a sudden it's not perfect and it's been damaged and a lot of times we know why you know cancer uh, from smoking that's pretty easy we already know smoking causes cancer alcohol known to cause cancer you know so when somebody has liver cancer it's I, I, it's like, okay, well, here's the source, you know? So I think also as individuals, if we take the most responsibility possible to do as best choices ever, then it will at least mitigate the cancers that can be prevented, you know? Sure. And then obviously there's some genetic ones, you know, when people were exposed to Agent Orange or, you know, Hiroshima and they were exposed to all of this radiation or nuclear radiation, that's why they have cancer, sure. you know? So I think that a lot of this topic is, depends on the cancer and yes there's a lot of money in the treatment but I think that there's generally a lot of heartache in the loss too and I think the last thing I would mention Elliot is like you know you see someone like Stephen Jobs who had like more money than anyone you would probably personally know and he had so much money I'm sure if there was a way to cure it he would have cured it you know he would have not had it but I think that like there are things that we still on earth technology at this moment don't possess or have to cure cancer at this point. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate uh, your position on that. Um, I've lost um, family members to cancer. So it's something that's, you know, near and dear to my heart too. So I hope we do get to that point where we can say we really know how to beat this. Uh, me too. And I think it comes down to what we, like you said, it's it's based on your decisions that you make over time that compile into these abnormal cells and um, you know, what you're ingesting and, um, the environments you put yourself in. I actually heard an interesting, uh, fact that Tom Brady has refused to eat strawberries for, I don't know, over 10 years since he learned that farmers, um, they use strawberries that don't make it into the packaging. Um, and they squeeze them down and there's enough pesticides in the crushed pressed strawberries that they use that to spray the next batch of crops just wow. from squeezing them down um and when you hear that you're like how is that possible that can't be true apparently there is some truth to it and caused tom brady to say he'll never eat a strawberry again unless it's a thousand percent organic i guess my thought process of bringing this up is do you think we'll ever get to a place where they stop banning harmful potentially harmful um, pesticides or sugars, um, manufactured products that um, they're putting in all of our foods. Like what if, what if one day everything had to be organic and all the fake sugars got ripped off the market? What would that mean for our society? Well, first people will probably have like a sugar withdrawal for the first at least week, right? Like everyone's like, I need sugar. <laughs> but after the withdrawal effects, I think you would start seeing people have like a natural energy, you know, they're not going to be having these highs and lows and crashes and things. And they'll have more of a stable energy. Number one, number two, I think that like the things that you've seen with like the bees where that we've like lost bees and they are sick and they don't know why, you know, we'll see the bees start flourishing again because, you know, I think of the exposure to all these chemicals and all these pesticides that kill things probably are not healthy for our bees that are then needed to pollinate all of our sure. food. Didn't think of that. And I think yeah, and then I think what'll happen is then we'll have these like beautiful, totally funky looking foods because they're not all like made to be perfect and rejected if they're not. And we'll actually have food that are like oversized, but just like, <laughs> wow, I've never seen this look like this. And, you know, you sometimes see that when you travel to foreign countries, you know, I went to Japan and I was like, 
I've never seen an egg yolk so orange. Like I've never seen it this orange. They're like, this is a healthy egg. I was like, yeah. wow, mine is like a light yellow, you know? And then the same thing with food, you know, sometimes in foreign countries, they'll tell me, be very careful when you eat the fruit because it has more vitamins and more enzymes than you are used to having in your processed farmed foods. And so it's true, like I'll eat it and I'm like, whoa, like, you know, I'll sometimes even get bubbly lips because it's just so much. It has such a high concentration of the actual fruit, you know? And so I think we will then have really good nutritious food and we won't have just this like commercialized farming and all this, you know, just turnover, turnover, turnover with a lot of pesticides and genetic modifications. I think we'll go back to being like, wow, I feel really awesome. <laughs> I would love to see that take place or at least people to know what they're uh, they're purchasing, right? To be able to um, kind of strong hand the producers to, to do what's right by the consumers. Absolutely. You're totally right. So um, I know we got a little bit off topic from uh, what we were originally going to discuss on this uh, podcast episode, but I've been having a lot of fun chatting with you about overall populational health and some of the gaps that we have in our society. But I will switch gears now. Um, tell me a little bit about culture in a medical group and how important it is to be successful. And ultimately, what can the executive suite level um, team do to help um, impact the culture of a medical organization? Yeah, I love this. You know, a lot of people join Health at Last literally because of the culture we have at Health at Last. And people want to be either franchisees or they want to be doctors working in our clinic or they want to, you know, own one of the clinics we have because of the culture we create. And so the way that we create a phenomenal culture is this, you know, we we have as a team, we let everybody know that like we will all be willing to help each other no matter what. There's nothing I would ever ask an employee to do that I myself either haven't personally done or will do and help them do. And I think when you create that kind of culture of like, we're here to help each other, what do you need help with? I'm here for you, you're here for me, let's go. That it's pleasurable to go to work. And you know, 70% of our time is spent at work. So we create a culture where it's fun and uplifting. One of the other cultures we also leave is like literally like whatever happens at home is at home and at work, you can make it as great as you'd like. So I always tell people, even if you've had like the worst morning, worst evening, biggest fight with your family, I hope not, but if you did, just leave it at the door. Like, let's just make this amazing. So, you know, usually what you'll see at a health at last clinic is people come in and they're like, good morning. Hi, come on in. And nice to see you. Oh, happy to see you. And I'll come on in. Hey, you know, we want to make it where everyone feels welcome. And I create this culture because what I've seen as a patient or just a consumer or seeing other clinics in the place, they'll have these big glass things closing from the receptionist. You have to hit this stupid bing, like bing. <laughs> and then the person like goes like this. Yes. Can I help you? And you're like, Am I bothering you? Yeah. you know, like you're already not feeling well. Like you don't need that. Sure. So we create a culture where we have no glass windows. People just come in and we're like, come on in, hi, ah, you know, welcome them. And I think that's first and foremost very important. Secondly, I don't know where this got adopted culturally, but somehow doctors or doctor's offices think it's okay to make patients wait. I don't know where they thought they could get away with that or why that's even happened. It's ridiculous. So in our offices, we have a policy of no waiting. Uh, so basically we immediately either right when they check in, we get them checked in, we get them into the room, we get them serviced. And because we have all the different providers at one office, oftentimes patients are seeing multiple providers. So if one isn't ready, we'll say, Hey, this other one's ready first. Would you like to see that first? And then go to that one and they'll be freed up. So you're not waiting. No one likes to wait. And so we've created a culture where they don't have to wait. So patients love coming to our office and they're willing to come frequently or just even stop by because they know that we will see them rapidly. The other part of the culture we create that is so important that we're trans wholly transferring out of how it's been to how it is in, in healthcare is we try to get patients in on the same day if ever possible. You know, so when somebody calls and they say, hi, I need to see a doctor. We're like, do you want to come in now or later from now? Like that's literally how we are delivering care. You know, I do that because I've been a patient before. And when people are like, we can see you in about a month and a half from now, I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, like I don't need you. And then what happens, and this is the problem that we're fixing with the culture, is then often other offices, not health at last, but they'll say, go to urgent care, go to the emergency room. So then you're waiting for 12 hours for them to tell you to follow up with your doctor who couldn't see you anyway. So we're changing that culture. So that's the biggest culture with that. Now, the next thing 
And what we do is by having all the different providers in one location, we're able to help and leverage off of our knowledge and expertise and wisdom together. So we're able to say, hey, I saw this on this x-ray. What do you think this is? Or, hey, this patient has this going on. How would you approach this? And it's like we're able to work collaboratively. I always say if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, or that's all you can do is hammer things. Versus like if we have all these different providers that have different approaches, then we're able to then not say, okay, you have a headache, here's a prescription. We're able to say, hey, you have a headache. Why don't you get some acupuncture points? Why don't you get the chiropractic adjustment? Why don't you get a massage? Let's make sure the nutritionist says that you're not eating anything that you're allergic to or that you have allergies to, and then come back and let's see how you're doing. Sure. And our patients are like, I haven't had a headache in months since I started care here. You know, and that's what we really love seeing. Now, the next part I would say to answer your question about how do you interact with executives and that executive suite and interacting with the staff and creating this culture. I respect my staff and expect them to respect me like I respect them and I give them ultimate respect. I just, I admire them. I appreciate them. I value them. And, you know, we couldn't do what we're doing without them. And I make them know that. So there was an interesting thing where somebody went to a high-end hotel and then they went to the Four Seasons. And at the Four Seasons, everybody worked there and seemed very happy. And at this other high-end hotel, no one seemed happy. And he surveyed the person at the Four Seasons and said, how is it that you love your job and you guys genuinely like it? You're not faking it. Like, it's not a fake, like, how are you today? Like, they actually like it. What is, what is it about this? And they said, the difference is, is when people come to me and ask from my executive level, they come and say, do you need any help? Do you need anything? Is there anything I could help you with? Versus at the other high-end hotel where people weren't happy, it was, what are you doing? Why didn't you do this? Did you do that? You forgot this. And they're like critical and not helping them and not enhancing them. So when you change the culture to make it more of like, hey, I see you're really busy. Is there something you want me to help you with? Or hey, I see you need a little extra help. How can I help you? It's like you're all helping carry that load Versus like, why aren't you doing that? And why didn't you do that? And why didn't that get done? And you did that wrong, right? So I think that that's a way that we create that culture. The other thing that we do that is really just incredible with Health at Last is all of our staff works as a team such that like if one wants a day off, we have a form where they have to have who's going to cover for them. So this works really well because instead of an, an employee coming to the executive going, well, I need next Wednesday off, and now the executive has a problem, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to solve it, we have our employee solve the problem. We say, great, once you figure out who's going to cover for you, then you submit your request with your solution, and then we can approve it. So sure. then they cover for each other, and then they are like, oh, I'll cover for you because you covered for me last time, and you know they're solving team their building. own problems. Yeah, they're team building and solving their own problems. So... We try to create it so that people that work with us, you know, they're working with us because of a purpose and because of a goal. And when you have that level of duty and purpose and passion, people work, you know, and they'll work way harder than any other things they could ever do because they love what they're doing and they see the whole team loves what they're doing and they're accomplishing it as a team versus, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I need to offer better benefits or more money or but, you know, they have all these reasons, but it's sure. like really people will work somewhere because they love what they're doing. Yeah. And I think it's so overlooked. And thank you for all of that. There was just uh, so many good takeaways from from your um, explanation of how to install a good culture in a medical organization. Um, and I always uh, think about how um, overlooked the importance of um, having that front line of defense in your medical office be extremely happy and caring to new patients right they're the first experience whether it's on the phone or in person that these patients have when they come into the office and i think um you know these people that are working for, at medical clinics or even in hospitals or any type of uh group that's treating patients they got into it because there's something inside them that wants to serve, right? They didn't get into it just for the money or the benefits. They really have a calling to serve and help others that are injured or sick. And for them to really feel, feel fulfilled, they have to be a part of helping people get better. And they have to feel like um, they're making a difference. I think that's what really checks the biggest box for a lot of people in the medical industry is they feel like they've made an impact and they can have a good comfortable living um that's always important but it seems like over the past let's say decade the the tides have turned from 
it being a, I'm the doctor, you're the patient, or I'm the doctor and you're my staff. What I say goes, you'll sit here and wait an hour and you'll be obedient. That's how it used yeah. to be. Yeah. But now it's changed to really, what I like to tell people is you might be in healthcare, but really you're a customer service business. Have to be. You're a customer service business. You might be a very well-respected doctor and everyone respects that and we appreciate your expertise, but now the consumers are in control. Yeah. From the, you know, the companies out there like Amazon or um, Zappos and people are expecting immediate high quality service and immediate high quality results. And exactly. The groups that fail to put the patients in charge of the experience and bending over backwards, so to speak, um, you know, whether it's for their patients or also providing that experience for their staff to be able to feel like they've made an impact, they're going to get lost in the dust. Um, nobody's going to want to work for them and the patients will not go and see them for treatment because now patients do their homework. They read reviews, they watch videos, they ask around town. They're not just going to go to the doctor that their family medicine doctor recommended. Um, That's so right. it's, you know, it's unfortunate it's taken this long to get to the point where we are in today, but it feels like the consumers are driving the ship now. Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, there's no reason for a doctor not to deliver exceptional, exceptional care, you know, which means being on time and being respectful of the consumer's time and delivering as much knowledge as they have and providing the service rapidly. Like, that is what we're here for. And, you know, we love when our patients do positive online reviews or they'll do a testimonial video. And that's really what the culture strives like and thrives on. Like we literally watch them during staff meetings and we're like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Or, oh, I'm the one who did that with him. And sure. oh, I'm the one who helped him. And that's what creates the culture is by feeding exactly what you said, the purpose to help. And so with Health at Last, we're very driven to provide excellent customer care, you know, and patient care. Mm -hmm. And you, we have the top of the top type of doctors, you know, some graduated from Yale and Harvard and trained at Mayo and sure. you know, we have a neurosurgeon and all these, like really top of the top of the top. But you're right. You can be as great and as far as you want. But if you have terrible care or customer service, bedside manner, or your staff are terrible, it's not going to matter. Right. Your consumers are not going to want you. So you're right. I really love that we're doing that. You know, sometimes there's, it's, it's nice because the patient's very educated. Sometimes patients are a little paranoid because they're like, well, I looked this up on Google and I'm like, okay, you don't have a brain tumor. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, like we try to help kind of calm them down because there is a lot of like random information, false information. Like you go on Google and type in that you, your finger hurts and all of a sudden yeah. you have a tumor and you're dying. You, know what you I have mean? a but brain eating immobia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, I thought I have this doctor. And I'm like, okay, well, let's check it out, you know. But I appreciate that they're becoming knowledgeable and researching, being part of it, because it is their body, it is their health. And the more empowered they can be and more knowledgeable they have, versus just like, doctor said I needed to take this and don't know why, I would rather have a patient say, do you think I need that? Are you sure? I read about these side effects. Are you positive? It's a team. That's what we should be. You know, the word doctor it actually comes from the derivation teacher. That's what we really are supposed to be, teachers. Mm -hmm. Teaching health, teaching wisdom, you know, teaching how the body functions so that they can optimize it themselves because it is their body shell that they carry around and occupy or, you know, take along with their lifetime. So that's how we create our culture with our patients and our staff and our executives and making a really great environment so doctors want to treat again. Because when they were last surveyed, when they would interview a bunch of doctors, like how many people would recommend someone to become a doctor? Very few people raised their hand. And a lot of them said, well, I have burnout. I'm tired. I don't like it. It's not fun. I'm disrespected by patients. Uh, I, the insurance companies don't want to pay or approve what I, I know is needed. And, they're, and, and, and I'm being forced to see more patients than I can service in a day. They're fed up. So we're like, okay. Let's just cancel all of that, yeah. come to help at last, and we'll get it so you have a patient panel that you can treat the way you know and want to treat them. And we're going to offer solutions and have a whole team that's going to back you up. And they're just like, oh, yes. And so it gives them that relief to make 
being a doctor joyful again, and then really making business owners excited to own healthcare that want to contribute, that are like-minded, that are like, hey, maybe I'm not a doctor, but I know how to run a business, or I know how to do marketing, or I know how to organize and gather teams. And so that's why recently, after our 10-year anniversary, we started letting more people into the franchise, which have been also executives and healthcare business owners, wow. you know, where they can contribute to this because we need everybody's help to get this done. Yeah, I'm sure when you share with uh, some of these providers your uh, operation and your playbook, they go, at last. Yes, they do. <laughs> and when they get this, that's why it's about the last. You're absolutely right. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure you guys are recruiting excellent providers and excellent supporting staff because your movement is so powerful and it's so meaningful and it's unique, right? It's it's hard to find an environment that you are providing. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the other thing I would always tell people is an employee will show up just as good as their executives are, right? So sometimes people are like, oh, that's a horrible employee, but then they come under our regiment and they're an amazing employee, sure. you know, and vice versa, a good employee will show up poor under a bad executive, right? So we really work to just cultivating and elevating and working as a team to make it a win-win situation for each and every person that works with our group. So is Health at Last um, a management company? Is it like an MSO organization? Yeah, it's a great question. So Health at Last itself is a franchise. And so each of the clinics, like if it's owned by a doctor, then they can just have a straight up medical corporation. If somebody is a non-licensed individual, then what the non-licensed individual would do with working with a state local attorney in healthcare that knows what they're doing is a medical corporation would be created that's owned and by shares by a medical doctor or a licensed individual. And then the non-licensed individual would own and operate the management service organization. And then the management service organization can provide whatever service that their state law allows yep. to that medical corporation and has that work. So that's how it is. So you're correct, very knowledgeable. Most people don't even know about that. But yeah, so it's a management service organization set up with a professional corporation for non-licensed individuals. People that are licensed, they just have the medical corporation and they don't necessarily have to have a management service organization. And then many of our franchisees actually also can own their own building, in which case they would then also have like a, a building entity that would own and operate the building. Sure. And how many states are you operating in? So right now would be like California, Idaho, Arizona, Colorado, Texas. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting somebody and I'm sorry, but we're, and so that's where those are. And then we're opening up, we have franchisees there, but we're currently in negotiations of doing an acquisition of their practice in uh, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Alabama, South Dakota. Um, again, there might be more, but I don't have much wow. on my head. One of the things though, that's really fascinating is like, you know, that's completely different in business that I love about Health at Last. Many businesses try to do startups and most startups fail after a year one, year three, five, for sure by year 10, like very statistically few succeed after those time periods. So what we do in Health at Last is uh, once someone becomes a franchisee, we find pre-existing practices. And what we do is we find a pre-existing practice and then we convert that practice into Health at Last. So, you know, whether somebody's retiring or someone's died or they're moving or they just don't wanna practice anymore, our franchisees with us helping them will take over that practice and purchase it. And then we'll implement all of the aspects of medical chiropractic acupuncture, massage and physical therapy. So the wonderful thing is we're not going from like, there's no walls. We don't even have a paper clip. We have no telephone. You know, we have zero patients. Instead of starting at that level, we're starting in a practice that's already been established, let's say for 40 years or 30 years or 10 years. They've already weathered economic uptrends and downtrends and survived through them. And they already have patients. So it's easier to get the momentum and keep the momentum going. I love that. So I think that, yeah, so I think that's also why people join Health at Last and see it to be very successful because of that model that we adopt versus, you know, trying to be like, okay, let's get patient zero, you know? <laughs> For sure. You are, you're, you're riding uh, equity in the community that's already been established. Yeah, and it keeps the legacy of care. You know, just because a doctor retires doesn't mean those patients don't still need to be seen. You know, like they are like, where's my doctor? We're like, hey, don't worry. We have another doctor that's going to take this over. And so we have the legacy of that being able to continue instead of it just being shut down. That's wonderful. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, why start from zero when you could be 65% of the way there? You just need some fine tuning on the operation and the direct to consumer efforts. 
Absolutely. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Tell me, how are you um, attracting new patients for these new franchises? Yeah, so we do a bunch of different a series of things. So we do a lot of things online. People will find us online because of our positive reviews, whether it be on Google or Yelp or different portals like um, ZocDoc or websites, sure. et cetera. Then we also have, we do a lot of community events, like we'll do community health fairs, we'll do um, business employee appreciation days where we'll go and give like free five minute massages or do a talk about ergonomics in the workplace. Sure. Um, so we do a lot of community events. And then we are also usually in network with most major PPOs and right. also with the Veterans Administration. And then um, attorneys absolutely love and adore our office model because the fact that we have medical doctors, there's chiropractor, acupuncture, massage, and physical therapy, you know, instead of them sending their client to five different places and who yeah. knows what service they're getting and five different reports, they have like one clinic with one consistent message about the patient. So we get a lot of referrals from them as well. So, you know, however we can get patients to come to get help that we have, you know, there are people that need to want our service. We're always open. And then we get a huge amount of internal referrals. Like once one person goes through the experience in health at last, they're like, can I bring my sister, my aunt, my uncle, my brother? I'm bringing my husband next visit. You know, it really cultivates with that as well. Sure. There's no better ambassador than your patients, right? It's true. I'm so grateful for them. And, you know, I tell one patient, she's referred so many patients. I'm like, I'm going to need to name like a wing of the clinic after you because, you <laughs> you know, she's like, no, it's just you've helped me and helped so many of my friends. And I just appreciate you guys. But, you know, I really thank our patients that are advocates for us because, you know, that's why we're there is to help people. And when when they can help us help more people by doing that word of mouth, it makes a big difference. Well, it's super exciting to hear that you guys are in network with most payers. That's, you know, a, a barrier to entry. And I know your mission is to provide access to care. Um, yeah. And I hope you open up in New Jersey. That's where our company is based out of Hoboken, New Jersey. I, I grew up in northern New Jersey. Um, and I also spend time in Florida. So I'll be looking out for you both in both locations. Yes, well, you'll be there very soon. They're negotiating right now as we speak. That's terrific. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today. I want to thank you again for our, your time. And I know our audience will have some really, really great takeaways from our conversation. And I want to wish you the best of luck as you continue spreading uh, health at last across the country. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, I really want to thank you for what you guys are doing. You know, it's like we talked about at the beginning of this podcast is like, it's going to take all of us working together as individuals into a group to make this difference and change. And just even what you're doing by bringing, you know, providers and healthcare, you know, leaders and different healthcare business owners together, just to even make it known what's out there by connecting different people together, we can get this accomplished. You know, if we can make illness optional. We can make prevention the way to go and we can empower and make it so that people that provide care want to continue to provide care, you know, and they have ways to make it easier for them, for their lives to be joyful as well. You know, I think we will accomplish all of the great things we envision together that we can have happen. So thank you for what you're doing. And if anyone is interested in Health at Last, they can always check out healthatlastclinics.com and happy to help in any way I can. Oh, that's terrific. And we're happy to do our part and, um, you know, open up these conversations. That's really the goal of this podcast. And we want to help empower patients out there to make the right decisions and ultimately um, provide healthier lifestyles. So um, thank you. And uh, we will check in with you in a few months and see how everything's going. Maybe we can bring you back on for a second episode. Would love it. You're doing awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah.